Okay, so I know you're expecting a couple more people. I just want to um, invite people if they're comfortable to turn their cameras on and say that it's going to be very informal today. Let me know when you want me to start, John. Or maybe I should do the introduction and then hopefully by then others, because I'm conscious of the fact we only have half an hour, so. Yes, I, I yeah. you know, I think it's a good time to start, Jocelyn. Okay. So hello everybody, welcome to this, uh, I'd like to say a pop-up webinar, which I think is great in the uh, spirit of life these days. Um, uh, my name is Jocelyn Bennett. I'm the director of the Compassion Project at AMS Healthcare. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you today the, um, uh, the presenter for the next uh, little while. Um, I know all of you are keenly interested in our uh, AMS fellowships in AI and Compassion. And I'm hoping that um, uh, Javid sharing his story with you will help you to understand and see the possibilities that this work has brought to the many fellows that we've uh, supported over the last number of years. Um, Dr. Javid Sakura is an associate professor with the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and cross-appointed to the Department of Pediatrics at the Schulich Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry at Western University. He's also a scientist in the Center for Educational Research and Innovation at Western. Um, he's got a very diverse interdisciplinary research program that it's focused around stigma reduction, implicit bias recognition and, and uh, working with health professionals. He's been well-funded for this work. And um, uh, interestingly, I think along with his, you know, uh, academic contributions in really high impact journals, he's also, uh, you may have heard him speak locally or nationally, uh, really tapped into in his expertise in equity, stigma and bias. And along with being a researcher, and I'm not sure how he ever finds the time for everything, um, he's been uh, actually is currently the chair of the uh, London Police Services wow. Board and is, uh, holds many uh, current and past uh, leadership positions, including past president of the Ontario Psychiatric Association. It is um, with joy for Javid and uh, perhaps a little bit of regret for the rest of us that uh, Javid is actually leaving uh, London this fall in uh, relocation to the Hartford Hospital in Hartford, Connecticut, where he will assume the chair of the Living Institute and the chief of psychiatry role there. And I think is going to really uh, launch uh, his, uh, or take his work um, in uh, implicit bias and stigma, et cetera to another level. So with that, I will stop and uh, turn the microphone over to you, Jeff. Thank you so much, Jocelyn, for the kind introduction. It's very humbling. I um, would say nothing else than, than that I am a uh, direct beneficiary of uh, the funding, the support, which goes beyond funding. I think it's part of being a community of practice that uh, the AMS organization offered and for sure for me, nothing in my career and my research would We have a technology. I was an AMS, oh. AMS Phoenix Fellow um, from 2016 to 2018, I believe. If I remember correctly, I think everyone's sense of time is skewed. <clears throat> and then I also received uh, one of the call for caring grants with a specific project that looked at the intersection between uh, compassion and digital technology. So in this journey, um, I never kind of came into it as a compassion researcher. Um, the concept, the, the conceptualization of the idea, it was something that was new and unfamiliar to me. I knew that my interest and my work aligned with this theme and this idea 
Um, but it took some time and deliberate uh, energy to begin to unpack what that really meant. I offered this brief time today because it's important uh, as part of this call that all of you who are interested in the funding uh, have the opportunity to discuss a little bit about how this isn't necessarily straightforward. It's not like you can just pick up a dictionary and say, hey, this is what it is and this is what we're doing. Uh, <coughs> nor can we assume that there's implicit linkages with clinical care. So we know that there's been numerous conceptualizations, but there's a couple of key commonalities. And there's two ways that I tend to look at that. The first is this idea of a dialectic between the recognition of the suffering of the other and a direct response to the suffering of the other. And the second elaborates upon that um, and, and the two key references. So the first I referenced a uh, protocol by David Wil Wilder, I think it's pronounced and colleagues who did a, a, a scoping review on digital compassion where they broke it down. Uh, and the second reference is highlighted here. This is from Oxford University's Handbook of Compassion Science. Now this one, I think, gives more space for you to try to think of how it applies to your project. So it includes awareness of another's experience. It includes some sort of subjective emotional experience. Um, the recognition of that emotional experience as a response to the other, some sort of attribution or judgment uh, around suffering, and then some sort of behavior, engaging in a behavior in an attempt to alleviate that suffering. The caution here is one of the things that's very clear, and I'm sure it's been clear, you know, Jocelyn's probably seen this evolve through the journey of the project, is it's not always uh, wise to embark upon a project uh, that you foreground compassion without taking some time to figure out what the heck that means for you uh, and for your project. And the reason for that is it's not that can, compassion shouldn't be infused and intrinsic to everything we do in healthcare. We all agree that it is and it should, <clears throat> but rather that it's methodologically, epistemologically, even linguistically and conceptually, compassion means different things to different people. And it's really important that you ground your research in what that means to you and how that fits for you. So how do people navigate that? Well, the call for proposals explicitly stated that includes empathy, respect, a recognition of uniqueness, willingness to enter into a relationship in which not only the knowledge, but the intuition, strengths, and emotions of both the patient and provider can be fully engaged. Now, this language aligns with a lot of what, what I believe, and it aligns with the spirit of, of the work through AMS. But the core criteria for the fellowships is that it explores a specific attribute of compassion and relates that to digital technology. It also requires that compassion is clearly defined and conceptualized in the proposal and that the exploration of compassion in relation to digital technology is core. It's not the side, it's not the fries, it's not the side dish, but it's the actual meal itself. The common pitfalls that people uh, tend to fall into is a lack of a definition or conceptualization. Um, it's super important that you're explicit and deliberate, that you define and that you relate, to, relate it to something in the literature if you can and if it's relevant. The other common pitfall is that lack of explicit linkage between compassion and the primary objectives of one's project. How that might show up. So I'm sorry if this is small. Can you read this okay or is it really small? It's okay. So Dr. Daniel Buckman, who I know at CAMH is an amazing scientist. He's a recipient, I think of the, it's the fellowship, right, Jocelyn, that he's a, a fellow. So his project uh, is in my subject area. So that's why I thought to bring it forward. He's looking at stigma and he's uh, exploring how stigma we know is associated with less compassion. And in his project, he's looking at the potential for AI to revolutionize healthcare including treatment of mental health and substance use. And uh, he's interested in language. So he knows that 
Biological language might help reduce stigma, but research suggests the opposite. Given this interest and the potential for AI to transform how we provide care, his project seeks to understand how AI language influences attitudes. And he's trying to identify whether the presence of language related to mental health and addictions influences levels of stigma, empathy, and compassion. Now, I give you this example. There's many, many examples on the website, so you can go and take a look. But the reason I, I share this example is because of my own work around stigma. And it's recognizing that even stigma as a concept is highly um, studied and people have different conceptualizations of it. If I'm writing a paper uh, or I'm writing a research protocol, I always have to say that this is the definition or conceptual framework I'm using for this concept um, so that readers and reviewers are oriented to, to what lens I'm bringing. It's also important to see in Dr. Buckman's project that he's not just taking it for granted that it's more compassionate to be less stigmatizing, right? We all know that that's kind of the case. He's deliberately mentioning that to the reader so that you know that that's, that's the linkage that's being made. Yes. The other example is totally fictional. Any similarity to anybody's project is totally coincidental. I just, I pulled this out of a hat. So this is hypothetical. Imagine if someone's trying to put together a proposal around cancer care, and we know that optimal care, high quality care requires compassion, and the, the researcher wants to use natural language processing and machine learning to analyze EHRs and use the findings to develop an algorithm to improve compassionate care. What do people think about this description? Feel free to just unmute yourself if you can. Well, you can't really identify the attributes of compassion in this, like there's no definition of what it means in terms of uh, what care, optimal care even means. Um, so it's hard to connect with what is being um, evaluated. Great, any other thoughts? There's um, kind of an assumption that not per, not compassionate care is being provided now or something like the comparator is not clear um compassionate care compared to non-compassionate care and there's sort of implicit that maybe it's non compassionate but it's not really clear yeah so it's totally true so i i kind of put this up i made this up um to highlight that it's not that this couldn't be an amazing project that fits. It absolutely can. But it's that the readers like you all right now have to make a couple of mental jumps and engage in a little bit extra effort to be able to make those linkages. And that's what I'm advising everyone to try not to do. Try to be deliberate in what you describe and what you conceptualize, just like you would if you were writing a peer reviewed paper, you would want the reviewers to not have to make inferences or project their, uh, I always say project their, their aspirate. You want them to project their aspirations, but you don't want them to have to do too much projection. So, you know, just, just to consider as we have a bit of a Q and A, why are you choosing this call? What is it about this call that you can link to the meaning of your work and, and what you're aspiring to do? Why a call for compassion? Is this a project that you're spinning or shaping to fit? Which is okay, we all do that in research. There's nothing wrong with that. But if that's what you're doing, just be conscious and aware of it because um, that will help you in writing the proposal. And the same goes for digital technology. Um, think about definitions, think about how you're relating the two. So it's that linkage that you want to be able to elaborate on. You don't have to have a PhD in either to apply. You don't have to get bogged down in theory uh, and rhetoric and nomenclature. I think it's as simple as being deliberate and intentional uh, in your understanding and your rationale and also humble and authentic um, in how you word and phrase your proposal. So that's it from my perspective. And I'm happy to sort of take questions or chat more.
Any questions or comments for any of us? I guess I'll break the ice um, and follow along with, with that conversation that you, we were just having. I, I feel like for, in my situation, I'm not like a hardcore academic researcher. I'm more on the operations side of, of uh, a hospital. And so uh, we do a lot of innovation projects. We do a lot of work, we, but our, our core focus or one of our core focuses is around delivering kind of innovation to the bedside and actually making change. I'm not saying that research is bad or, or anything. It's just not our, our core focus. And so um, I'm struggling in my application around, you know, we probably have, I don't know, 15, let's say projects going at one time. And we are all trying to bring this compassion, kind of compassionate lens. Um, we didn't use that terminology before, but we do have that kind of embedded in our work. Um, and so, so I guess I'm, originally I was thinking about this from a leadership perspective, building my leadership, but I feel drawn or like somehow that I need to package it into a little research project. Those two things. Okay. Yeah, so I, I you blipped a bit at the end there, but I think I caught Sorry. part of what you were saying. And I believe you do work in design and human factors type stuff, right? Yeah, you got it. So, so I can totally relate. Uh, a lot of what I do is around impact and knowledge mobilization, knowledge translation, things like implementation science. Um, when I started my PhD, I was like balking at the idea of getting bogged down into too much of the theory because I wanted the work to have impact. So I totally get that. I don't think you have to try to fit a square peg in a round box, but I would say even with uh, impact or design, knowledge translation, knowledge mobilization, uh, business and leadership, the idea of a theory of change is pretty pervasive, right? Yeah. And the concept of a theory of change is simply we know what we're trying to do if it's an intervention is that this is supposed to do this, right? Yeah. And it's in that theory of change that that, that conceptual framework would fit. Um, and I think that's where I would encourage you to just apply it back that if this is what I'm trying to do, whether it's an implementation project or uh, intervention or research, uh, how do I link compassion and digital technology to my theory of change? I encountered this a bit. Um, one of our projects, the grant, we did a digital uh, learning ex exercise or activity, and it fell within a transformative learning paradigm for which there's less uh, logic models for evaluation. Hmm. So we had to derive a new logic model um, for a paradigm that resists kind of that kind of logic model. Hmm. It felt that way as well. But um, myself and the research associate, we just kept going back to our theory of change. Like, what are we expecting? Right. How are we expecting those mechanisms to move it forward? Right. Cool. Thank you. And I think, uh, you know, just to um, uh, maybe build on that a little bit, and, uh, you know, as I'm looking at Javid, um, you know, the, the purpose of the fellowship is, you know, you'll, you'll anchor it around a project, or sometimes people will have, you know, multiple small ones uh, tied together with concepts. But the, the goal of this is to develop individuals uh, so that they become like Javid that they are leading in this area, they're, uh, they're contributing, whether that's in practice, in education, in research, however it is that you lead. Um, and we really, we look to that because we, um, where AMS has found good success in terms of trying to transform the healthcare system around this concept is by developing the leadership that will, you know, ideally, early mid-career people, that's all of you, who will start to take these concepts forward and grow throughout your career. And so, um, you know, it is it is really, it's about the concepts and ideas, but it's about, you know, what is it that you are going to need over the year of this fellowship and beyond to be able to start to move some of this? Because I can tell you, I mean, I've been with AMS five years and when we first started talking about compassion, most people said, Oh, yeah, 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 we got that. We do that. We're, you know, I'm a nurse, I'm a doctor, I do that. 
Um, and, you know, it was usually a proxy for communication. So as long as we talk to patients somehow, um, we were being compassionate. Well, we understand that it's more than that. And now I think the, the laser light that's gone on to this area through COVID has really highlighted for us that we need to think conceptually clearly about this. And we need people who are going to lead this, particularly at this intersection of technology, because we see it as an opportunity for those two things to work together to get us to some place we wouldn't have otherwise gotten. So. And just to, to supplement that, that's why I would say don't be too nervous or apprehensive because this opportunity is an organization really willing to invest in uh, someone as a, as a, a change agent, but also in ideas. And not all ideas are at the stage of being well fleshed out. So it's okay to say, you know, we don't know very much about this, and this is something we're seeking to explore. Uh, I think it's okay to be tentative and authentic, uh, but I would say then just be deliberate about that. I'll jump in. I have a question. Um, I actually have a question about the mentorship team. I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit about um, you know, what are ways that you would envision are optimal ways to engage our mentorship team in this kind of fellowship? So, I mean, I'd love to hear Jocelyn's perspective on that as well. I can just give you my own experience uh, for the different fellowship that had a different focus that I was part of. <laughs> my mentor actually switched halfway through. Um, and I think that was because I started off with a mentor who seemed to be um, more related to someone I wanted for me to get the fellowship. Um, whereas the mentor I switched to was more of the natural mentor who supported and cultivated um, me holistically rather than the specific side of me that might be doing the fellowship. So that, that was my experience. I think having uh, mentors is crucial, it's essential as part of this work to be, again, deliberate about develop, <laughs> developing oneself professionally and personally. And I think having uh, this sort of team of people that you see as part of that development is important. Um, and ideally, if you have people that can do that, not just in relation to the call with a specific expertise that you need for the project, but also someone that can support you um, and is at a career stage where they're they're uh, ready to invest in you and and support you. One of the nicest things for me was at my AMS graduation, my mentor Chris Watling surprised me and showed up in Toronto. Um, and I think for me that was just such a great highlight of of my career. But it also meant a lot that AMS deliberately honors the mentors as part of honoring the the mentees. Yeah, the, the fellowship, uh, di we differentiate the notion of supervisor versus mentor, as I think you've all seen. Um, and we, the, the supervisory piece is really, and some people always kind of struggle with that language, but in whatever institution you're in, um, we all have accountabilities. So who is that individual who's gonna say, I'm going to take the, make sure that the roadblocks for the individual to be able to have the time and, and um, supports within the organization to do this work. So it may be a departmental head. It may be if you're in a, um, maybe your, your, your dean or the director of the school that you're in, it could be um, your sort of direct supervisor in if you're working within an organization. We wanna know that you have the support for this um, but then as, as Javid says, it's thinking about the mentor in, and we've seen um, individuals where actually the supervisor and the mentor has been the same person. And we've actually seen people build out mentorship teams saying, you know, I need, I need expertise in this, but I also, um, you know, want to do some further learning in this area. It could be, you know, communication or whatever. It's not just enough to develop this the, the expertise here, but really how then do I disseminate that? And, and you know, one of the activities that is a requirement uh, for fellows is that they participate in um, a policy workshop that uh, OSSU organizes for the fellows. And that's with Dr. John Lavis, who's a guru of all 
you know, uh, policy translation. So we're looking at how do we take these ideas and move them into action. So, uh, um, and it may be that you, you also think that there's, given the concepts of compassion, that there are uh, patients or caregivers in the environment that you're in that may be also able to provide some support and input into that. So you can be creative. Um, we, you know, because we've had to be, move virtually the last 18 months, and we anticipate that that's likely going to be, you know, for probably at least another uh, 12 months is that's why we have included an honorarium for people just to recognize the work that they do. And that's separate from the fellowship, but it is, a, it is you know, a bit of a recognition for people who commit time uh, for the uh, activities that we do. Bonnie? Um, can I just clarify? Um, so on the application that got returned, um, it says, you know, the, the distinct areas where we can improve upon our application. Um, are we able to add more mentors then, like an, an additional mentor from the LOI? Or are you wanting us to stick with the, the persons who were on the um, original LOI? I think if there's... Um you know, if you've had fellowship or you further do, pardon me, feedback or you're further developing the concepts and you think, I really need this piece here, um, then we don't limit. I mean, the limits on this and jump in, John, if I get it incorrect, um, we're very rigid on the, 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 the length and the content there. But if you feel that it's going to add to the fellowship, but meaningfully add, right? It's, uh, um, if you think that there is an opportunity to strengthen out, um, then I would say, I mean, if your supervisor shifts and you haven't shifted roles, I'd, we might wonder what's going on there. Uh, but certainly I think for mentorship, you need to reflect carefully on that and have the team around you that you would need to be successful. Yeah, Jocelyn, I, you're absolutely right um, where you need to. And the only thing I would just add is that if you run out of space on the signature form, uh, you can submit a second uh, signature form with your application. So I think we're at our time. I don't see any other hands and I've seen a lot of nods. So I take that as, oh, did you have another question, Connie? Oh, Laura, glad you found out. Oh, yes. That was very helpful. And thanks for the presentation, Jimmy. That was fantastic. Did you have a question, Salima? Yeah, hi, Jocelyn. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I had a question, Jocelyn. Actually, um, uh, the project that I submitted is actually, um, and that I'm really passionate about is, is a qualitative exploration um, uh, of um, the compassion in digital health to a particular population uh, in which the phenomenon has not been explored before. So I just wanted to, to confirm in terms of methodology, uh, are qualitative explorations as much <clears throat> appreciated as far as this particular funding is concerned? Or um, are you guys more sort of um, interested in you know, looking at uh, the impact of a, a digital health, particular digital health intervention or a solution? Uh, we're very much focused on whatever fits the work that you're doing. So it's not about um, that I have to do a knowledge translation or I have to do this and that. Because the goal of the project is while it's developing, uh, you know, concepts and ideas in your work, it's really developing you with your mentorship team to how you would then move forward as a leader. So if there's anything we're looking at is we, we look at how this comes together to really build the leadership potential of individuals. So I bet much of the res research we fund, um, this is not a specific research, but when we have funded uh, research, much of it's qualitative because that's the nature of the, the work that we do. Um, and so I would say uh, neither is weighted one way or the other. What we're looking for is what's the fit with what you're trying to accomplish. How does what you're trying to accomplish align with developing you as a leader in compassion in technology moving into the future. So 
Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much, okay. Joseph. You're welcome. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Um, if you have questions, you have John's email. He's right there for me. Um, so uh, do reach out and uh, good luck, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.